Hello and welcome to Tether's Human Environment Podcast, where we talk about the intersection between people, the homes we live in, and the natural things that impact our health, our lifestyle, and our property. With me is co-host, Brandon Van Blerk, who is the founder and CEO of Tether, a New Zealand tech startup that works with building homeowners and occupants to solve building performance problems, improve health, reduce cost, and help create a sustainable future. Welcome, Brandon. Hi, Colin. Good to see you. Brandon, you recently launched COVID Care, which is a product to help us manage COVID transmission in the built environment. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what is COVID Care? Well, COVID Care is basically a software product, a product that Tether created to try and reduce the fear that we have of the environments we currently live and work and play in. It came as a result of us having a number of conversations with our customers who were frustrated by the impact that COVID had to their business and their schools as well. Just giving people insight into how those environments were performing from a health and an environmental quality perspective, which is obviously quite dear to Tether's heart. And we did some research on what we could potentially do. In some respects, COVID and environmental quality may seem quite diametrically opposed to each other. But when you start to delve deeper, you actually realize that there's a much bigger link than you think. Environmental quality and the transmission of aerosol-based diseases or viruses like COVID are actually inextricably linked. And they happen to be linked through a data or metric measured through carbon dioxide. So this was the idea that we had, knowing that carbon dioxide is a great way to measure ventilation rates. And we then started to do a number of research, both with local and international scientists, to see whether this was something that anybody else had thought of and whether there was any actual peer-reviewed research around it. And we, we found some pretty compelling evidence on the links between carbon dioxide and COVID transmissibility. And it was at that stage we said, well, let's do something. As a company, as Tether, why don't we do what we do best and show how buildings perform through data and try to reduce some of the fear that people have around COVID by giving them an indicator of risk. You know, how risky is this building? How risky is this office? How risky is the school in terms of the ability to contract COVID while in that space? Wouldn't it have just been a bit easier and cheaper to go with CO2 monitors? What What is it that makes COVID care special or different? Well, it's not cheaper, actually. COVID care is relatively cheap. I mean, if you look at one of the, the suggested sensors out there, which you can't actually get in New Zealand, but it's called the RNET4, which is a little portable CO2 sensor that you can take with you. It's got an LCD screen on it. And I think it comes in at roughly $370 in New Zealand unshipped. Our, our solution's a little bit cheaper than that. So price aside, COVID care is all about COVID. It's not about carbon dioxide. So these CO2 sensors, what they'll give you is a carbon dioxide part per million reading. You know, there's 850 parts per million of CO2 in the air. And it's up to you, Colin, to understand what that means. And I can guarantee you that the most of us don't even know what a part per million is and what Absolutely 850 <laughs> parts per million of carbon dioxide means. So buying a CO2 sensor for the vast majority of people means absolutely bugger all. You know, they're going to have to educate themselves quite substantially to understand what are the risk zones, why are they there. So what we've done is we've taken a scientific data point like carbon dioxide, and we've understood the environment that the sensor is installed. Uh, our sensors aren't portable. Our sensors are installed in the rooms that matter, right? Your offices, your daycares, your schools, and the places that are frequented frequently. And we install these sensors in these rooms. And we also understand the room that it's installed in. So we know the nature of the room, what takes place in there. Is it a library? Is it an office? Is it a school? Is it a gym? And that nature of that room actually has an impact on the transmissibility of COVID. We understand the dimensions of the room, which also is really important. We understand the temperature in the room, which is important for COVID decay rates, for example. We understand the ventilation potential in that room, and we're obviously monitoring carbon dioxide. So as a result, what we give you is just a really easy to understand dashboard of low risk, uh, medium risk, high risk, and then we give you some 
alert systems to tell you when things are not right, telling you to open a window if we know that you have one, turn on an ex extraction system or ventilation system. We really want to hold your hand through the COVID fear base rather than just saying, here's a CO2 metric, uh, 850 parts per million, do with it what you like. We've done all the hard work for you. We've taken all the science and all we're giving you is this is what you should be doing based on the room that you're in, which I think is far more powerful. How does it differ from your existing suite of products? Well, it doesn't. So here's the fun fact, right? If you have an EnviroQ, which is our fully fledged environmental quality sensor, it monitors temperature, humidity, carbon dioxide, light, sound, atmospheric pressure. If you buy that, or if you have one today, you will get COVID care for free. It's included. It's basically a software update where we're taking the carbon dioxide measures as well as the temperature and humidity measures and some other things around the room, and we're turning that into a COVID alert system for you. So it's an add-on. It's an add-on feature. And dare I say, you won't, don't even need the EnviroQ, really. If you have an existing CO2 sensor installed in your building, you know, let's say you've You've already spent thousand dollars or thousands of dollars installing CO2 monitors in your offices or your schools, and that's a sunk cost. And now you don't want to buy tether hardware to get COVID care. That's okay. We can actually link the CO2 reading that you're getting from your sensor, and we can put it through the COVID care system so that you can get the alerting and the dashboarding and all of that stuff. So COVID care is a, is a software solution. Anybody that's a current tether customer and that has one of our bio queues gets it for free. And that's the thing about Tether, isn't it? It's, it's you're less of a, a tech and hardware company and more of a data analysis and, and making the data practically applicable so that normal people can apply this information in their everyday lives. That's kind of the essence of Tether. Am I right? Yeah, we're in the business of connecting people to their buildings. And what I really mean connecting as in giving them an understanding of their building, which they've never had before through data. So it's, it's this connection between yourself and your home, yourself and your office, yourself and your school, and getting the data that you need to understand whether you're healthy, whether the, the building is being run efficiently, what the impact of the planet is, you know, this health pocket planet focus that we have as a business. And it is a data company. We happen to have hardware, yes, but we also have partner companies that provide us hardware solutions that bring us different data streams. We uh, allow other companies to input their data streams in order to generate insight through our system. So for us, the end result, what we really sell is the insights to health, the insights to efficiency, the insights to sustainability through that connection to your building, the connection to the, the place that you're in. And this is where COVID care will sit. It sits in that space around health. It sits in that space around um, safety and protection and, and using data to give you peace of mind about the building that you currently connect to. I noticed you have COVID care for schools and COVID care for businesses. How do they differ? So they differ in the, in the building's construction and how they're operated. So I think I mentioned briefly earlier that the utilization of the room is actually really important. So the calculations that you use to understand the risk of transmissibility in a classroom is actually quite different to that of a office environment. Reason being in an office environment, you often have far better ventilation strategies. You might have more people in an open plan environment. You have different types of HVAC systems and things that are being put in place. Plus the nature of just conversation is quite different in an office to in a school. In a school, in a classroom, you have one person, the teacher, hopefully, that is speaking a lot and is you know, constantly talking, or hopefully not, but screaming sometimes. And they would be the main spreader of the virus. If the teacher was, was infected, it would be very hard for for kids in the front row, for example, not to get some form of viral load from that as the teacher starts to ex expel vapor. Whereas in an office environment, that's slightly different. You've got people that are in pockets, they move around, they sit at their desk, sometimes they don't talk to anybody. So understanding the ventilation rates in a classroom is quite different to understanding the, the ventilation rates in a business as it specifically pertains to transmissibility because of the way that COVID is transmitted and the suspension of particles in the air and how long they stay suspended and what the viral load might be. So there's all of these pieces of information that go into making 
the most fit for purpose calculation for that use case. So schools are different in terms of how they are utilized to offices, and that's the difference between the two COVID care for schools and COVID care for offices. It's in the calculations, it's in the data. What is your main objective with COVID care? Reduce fear. So just just reduce fear. We believe that as we do with our existing product set around understanding, you know, warm, dry, healthy buildings, we know that through data, it gives you the ability to make informed decisions. And if you know that a building is well ventilated and continuously ventilated, you know that going in there is a far less risk of you catching something, specifically COVID in this example, than if there was no ventilation at all and you ended up with someone that was sick going in there two hours later and now all of a sudden you have COVID-laden uh, suspended particles that are still in the room two hours later as opposed to 15 minutes later, it's all gone. The number one goal would just to, to be to give people insight into the building's safety from a COVID transmissibility perspective for the purposes of reducing fear and getting people to feel more comfortable. It's also a, a, an awareness thing as well, isn't it? Because what I'm hearing you say is that different rooms have different levels of risk when it comes to transmissibility of COVID and, and other, other viruses. So if I walk into a particular room or a dairy or a takeaway or a restaurant or a conference room, I'm going to be able to tell, hopefully, what my level of risk of transmission is in that particular room or, or facility. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I saw, I think it was a couple of days ago, a post on Twitter where someone had taken a picture of a dashboard in a Japanese cinema. They had all the cinemas and then they had the parts per million of CO2 in each cinema and whether there was a risk zone within that cinema or not. And that is something I think is going to become far more prevalent is getting people to understand and realize that, hey, this is a safe environment to be in from a transmissibility point of view, from a ventilation perspective. So there the cinema knew, obviously, that their ventilation rates were really good. And so what they were doing is they were advertising the fact that they had a healthy, low risk environment so people could go back to the cinemas. A healthy environment is a, a competitive advantage, is what I'm hearing. Absolutely it is, if you can advertise it, for sure. You know, and this is something that COVID care can do through our dashboarding, is it can demonstrate to your customers, to your parents, if you've got a school or to the kids, that the classrooms are as healthy as they can be. But there's always risk. It's not a cure mm. for COVID. Mm. But what it is, is it's a ability to remove anxiety or reduce anxiety and to give you give you some power back, some sense of control. You know you're moving into a low risk zone. It's like getting, you know, the warning side when you when you're driving, you're doing a long road trip and you get the warning side saying, you know, reduced speed, hairpin bend ahead. If it, the sign wasn't there, you might have to slam on anchors and go, oh God, I, you know, I might be going off the edge. But the fact that the sign's there means you go, okay, I know what I'm dealing with. I know I can go around the bend at a decent speed. So it's not going to stop the bend. It's just going to help you navigate it better. It's going to make you feel comfortable about what's ahead. It would also probably equip um, businesses to push back. So for example, at the moment, there are certain types of businesses that are not allowed to open because mm. there's a perception that, you know, there's a higher risk of transmission in those mm. environments. For example, a cinema. Businesses will be able to look at the data and actually go, well, actually, that's not true in the whole industries and go and say, this is the reality here to the government. We shouldn't be limited by guesswork. You make a very fair point because... I haven't measured it, but I'd be really interested to see what the ventilation rates are like in Countdown, for example, or you know, in New Worlds and things, because what you have is people lining up in queues, and if you have an infected person that's busy breathe, breathing out and you don't have decent ventilation, what you could end up with is this big buildup of covid latent particles suspended in the air for what could end up being hours, and you have people walking through that cloud as they as they go. So. It's really interesting to see. Everybody's ch channeled through a really narrow inference when 
going into supermarkets. Well, what's been the response from schools? Where's the demand coming from? What are the opportunities that you're seeing emerge? So the opportunities really have come from overseas, not from New Zealand. We're only just starting to tap into the New Zealand market and understand New Zealand schools' appetite for adopting something like this. This is the first solution of its kind. There is no other um, solution like this um, within New Zealand and, and the world. There are some people that are sending their kids to school with these portable CO2 sensors, but understanding what 850 parts per million is is quite tough at the best of times. But we're finding that there's huge demand in the UK and Berlin and the United States where you know schools are starting to mandate carbon dioxide sensors within their classrooms to understand these ventilation rates and to and to align it with some sort of COVID risk mitigation strategies. So we're feeding off the demand that we know is overseas and we're creating a solution for New Zealand, for New Zealand schools. We hope it'll be adopted. We are approaching the private schools to start with, and then hopefully the MOE will start to raise its its eyebrows at it and, and look to potentially roll it out across the public schools. But at the moment, it's still um, still early days. Do you have any sort of tips you could, you could offer regarding environmental building tactics for schools and businesses when they're reopening? In the era of COVID, you know, we got lockdowns and, and out of lockdown and in, in and out, you know, do you have any advice around that? Yeah, well, the first thing is become informed. I always believe, and this is this is at the heart of Tether, that data is king and you need to understand what you're working with before you try to put a plan in place. If you're just going to go say, I'm going to spend thousands of dollars beefing up my ventilation systems or putting in some sort of extraction system without actually understanding if you have a problem first, then uh, that's money down the train. It's not money well spent. So doing some analysis on what you're actually dealing with is a really good start. So get some CO2 sensors in, understand you know, what your ventilation rates are like. If they're really poor under normal typical operation, then you can start to put a plan in place on how to improve that. Because ventilation isn't a you know, one size fits all science. You need to understand the amount of people in a room at any given time or the maximum amount of people in a room at any given time. You need to understand you know, what the dimensions of and the volume of the room might be. You need to know where you can install the ventilation or extraction systems, whether there's any, any space in the roof cavity or whether you need to put something within the wall cavity to be able to expel outside. And there's multiple different options that you have to go through, but you don't cure a disease without a diagnosis, right? You cannot say, I'm going to try and fix something unless you know what you're fixing. So just going and installing a ventilation system because that's what you've heard is the right thing to do is not the right thing to do. You should actually decide whether you needed to do it in the first place and how bad the problem actually is. So that data is available. We know from a ventilation perspective, we know, understand how many air changes are required. We know what the CO2 rate needs to be to be in the healthy band. You can do some analysis and then start to figure out what's the best way to start to solve your particular problem, which will be different to anybody else's. In closing, a quick reminder, Tether is the first building performance insights platform that makes it easy to have full visibility of a building's operating efficiency and environmental impact through data-driven insights. If you are a landlord, property manager, or somebody who lives under a roof, you can find out more about Tether at www.tether.co.nz. This is me, Colin, saying thanks for joining us and goodbye. Thank you, Brandon. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it.